so excited to dive into this uh, discussion inshallah i mentioned to you uh, in the comments just how much i was uh, sorry in, in instagram uh, on instagram just how much i was inspired uh, by this book uh, and a little bit of a funny story that involves Hasnain as well uh, which i mentioned to you <laughs> um, I, I was basically traveling uh, the states earlier this year uh, and just uh, on a bit of a journey of my own mentally and, and, and spiritually and just kind of like thinking about religion and faith and really just praying to Allah for a bit of guidance and the journey of mine ended at uh, of all places has named flat uh, in New York City um, and I was rummaging through his stuff which uh, you know he, he doesn't want me to but I do it anyway and I found uh, Secrets of Divine Love um, and I have to say the minute I opened it uh, until now I'm still reading it by the way uh, I was just absolutely blown away so I can't make enough duas for you and thank you so much for, for, for writing this book and I can't wait to get into the hows and whys uh, of this book I will give the caveat that I haven't finished it yet the reason being is because I'm enjoying it so much I want to take my time with it um, but inshallah I, I, I'm sure that by the time I finish it I will come out um, a, a, trans, a changed person much like I'm sure many people uh, have so thank you so much and duas uh, for your great way, excuse Nuri great excuse for stealing we Hasnain. know you don't read <laughs> <laughs> I read of course it started with me stealing your book but hopefully Allah will forgive me for that inshallah um, so hello just, just to start off the, the classic question um, it, obviously it's a beautiful book um, what pushed you uh, to write it I mean what was kind of like the 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 the, uh, the moment I guess uh, where you decide to sit down and write a book uh, on faith and on uh, uh, you know divine love. Yeah, that's um that's a great story. Um, first of all, about um, <laughs> I've been a book thief from here and there with some <laughs> of my friends' books. I, I call it prolonged borrowing. Um, <laughs> so I'm not giving this back though. So that's just it's definitely stealing for me. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> It's all right. I got, I got a new copy coming on the way, so that's, we're good. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the book and what inspired it, um, it's actually interesting. I mean, I had started, about, I think now it'd be like around eight years ago, Quran quotes daily, once I started learning from a few teachers about Islam. So I would take these classes and I'd learn, and they were so profound. Um, teachers were, you know, none of these teachers were online and um they just like their teachings and the way they taught it nothing was new about what they were saying but just the way they taught it was not accessible hmm. so i started sharing that online and just very casually i had no real intention with it i just want i felt so grateful i didn't know how to say thank you and that was my i guess way of saying thank you to allah and then it just sort of grew and this became a mini community and People would ask questions, and I was learning a lot about Islam, and I was years into my studying, but I didn't know a lot of the answers. And so then I would go back to them, and I would study, and I would <laughs> like read books and books and books to be able to answer. And it was just like it was a very natural progression of learning. Um, and mm -hmm. so I just had these stacks of notes, and I would spend a lot of my days learning um, when I could, and then it felt like there's this moment where uh, I kind of explained in the introduction. It sounds so weirdly mysterious, but it, it was exactly how it felt, which was, I felt like this, this prayer, this like, um, just like how people would ask questions and they would type it in an inbox. It felt like my inbox of my heart, like gone, like it's almost like overheard this like prayer of wanting something that like I was meant to be a part of answering. I did not know what it meant. I'm not like this perceptive person. I don't have like these visions. Like I don't have any of that. So it was just an odd feeling. And I thought, okay, well, maybe I'm supposed to um, like be vigilant when someone asks a question. I put my extra in answering what they have. So it's sort of like I just didn't think much of it. And then it came back around and I was like, huh. And then it felt very clear like I'm supposed to write a book. Oh, what? A book? Like, it felt like so out of my capability. The best word is capability. Um, some people are very talented in, like, writing <laughs> and, like, can really... I just felt out of my capability, like a long-form book. And so, um, but yeah, I just thought, okay, well, I'm going to begin and see where it goes. And that was essentially the process of beginning and seeing where it goes and about three years later, um, the book was finished. Oh. Uh, and then I thought, okay, I did what I felt like, okay, maybe this is what it feels like to be guided and 
I felt so right. And I was like, okay, I, I'd success it. Like I put it out into the world. Like I kind of thought I was done. Like I was done. I'd put this book out and okay, Alhamdulillah. Like I felt like I did what I was doing. And then I didn't realize like, oh, it's just the beginning of something totally different. Um, and then I started getting interested in prison work and actually through Secrets of Violin learned a lot about prisons and so that took like this whole another trajectory and so yeah and then I learned about translations in certain countries that people don't like publishing houses and distributors don't care about because like oh there's no money to be made we don't care about sending them books or having books available in those countries but then online there'd be people messaging me like hey how do I get the book in Bangladesh or um, you know, a particular village in India or in Pakistan. And, and I would be like, okay, cool, let me ask my poet. And then the poet was like, we don't care about these countries. They don't make any money. Like, it's so difficult to deal with, piracy, blah, blah, blah. So then it kind of made me think in terms of like, well, what if you didn't care about that? What would it look mm -hmm. like? And what if you just did it anyways? And what if it was a hassle and it wasn't worth your quote unquote hourly rate that we're used to like having in a capitalistic culture? what it looked like so the book kind of is weird because it began it's like very much feeling like this like call I guess to serve in service but but like if I had to be honest I sometimes think it was like my own self from the past like wanting something as a child a younger girl wanting something a way to approach God from my heart and so sometimes I just feel like we're stuck in time but Allah isn't and so maybe it's just a different part of us asking asking for, for something that another part of us is meant to deliver. I know you didn't ask for all that. But <laughs> Beautiful. That, would, I love that, that was amazing. That I was amazing. Hasnain, go ahead. You have a question? Um, yeah, so one thing that popped out to me that you said was um, the translation of books, right? And um, it's very interesting because I actually never mentioned this to anybody, but I have friends, especially in Pakistan, I remember... Um, they asked me because, you know, I posted the book on my Instagram when I was because you have these beautiful quotes and these beautiful sayings that are in there that I want to share with other people. Um, and I remember uh, a friend of mine who actually lives in Fox and was like, so lucky, like, can you keep sending me pictures or snapshots of, of, of the book so I can read it, too? Wow. And I was like, yeah, sure, I, I'll, I'll do it. And like I'm getting like four or five people on Instagram saying, like, oh, like, can you post some more? Because, you know, this is an amazing book. And then in my mind, I was like, okay, great. Like, this is awesome. Like, people actually want me to post something. So I kept posting, I kept posting, to, to realize that the book isn't available there. Mm. So I actually sent to the Pakistan, to, to like this individual, I'm like, hey, what's your address? Like, I'll send you a book, you know, uh, whatever. And I also sent one to Iraq as well, wow. um, mm. because they don't have access there. And like, like um, a friend of mine, he, he lives in Iraq, and obviously he was born uh, in, here in D.C., moved back, and he was like, yeah, can you send me this book? And I'm, I'm like, well, yeah, what book do you want? In my, in my mind, it's like he wanted like some English translation of like one of like the the major books. I'm like, yeah, whatever. I, I'm pretty sure you can get it in Iraq. Why would you ask me to get it from the, from the U.S.? <laughs> but it ended up being the book. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, sweet. I'll just bring it. And then I just took it with me when I went to Iraq. And I'm, it, it's very astonishing how um, people want this book, but you know, the language barriers is kind of what's getting in the way or like the access to it's kind of getting in the way, um, did, which is uh, very, very interesting. Did, 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 did the reaction to the book Hillowa surprise you? I mean, it's, it's basically an international bestseller, right? And so, it, it, like you said, it's built a whole community. Uh, I'm guessing it's not what you intended or foresaw when you first sat down to, to, to write the book. I mean, how has that, how has it changed your life? And, and, and how do you, you know, like retrospectively, how have you, how has it impacted you essentially, the, the, the reaction to this book? Yeah, um, I mean, it, in terms of what um, Brother Hassanain said too, um, in terms of it was firstly just a translation. That's one of the reasons I think um, wanting it to be more accessible. Like we're working on an Arabic translation um, right now, and actually there's a distributor in Pakistan who has the book. Because one of the things for me which was important is for it to be like cost effective mm. for people. Because expecting someone to buy a sixteen or an Amazon changes prices, but like twelve, sixteen dollar book in certain parts of the world, like is like us buying like a sixty dollar book, you know. So it has to make sense for people of uh, like that place, you know. Um, so I think, like, thank God, places like um, Pakistan, which is like a really amazing distributor, who like oh, actually there's a publisher who's 
who's now makes the book available in the country. I don't know, in a handful of stores, whatever, but, and the Arabic version hopefully coming too. And all that in response to Nori, what you had mentioned. <laughs> yeah, I did not expect any of this. Um, I, I didn't plan for it. I thought, okay, I'll get great. Like, uh, it kind of came out right before Ramadan and I was like, oh, cool. Like, people are reading it. Like, that's great. Like, you know, um, and I had no idea that it was going to be this, it was going to like storm the internet, which is basically what happened. Um, because most people are like, I saw your book everywhere on Instagram. I'm like, I don't know why, because I didn't like plan for that. Like I didn't have this, I self published it. So there's no like big wow. publishing house behind it. Um, and at the time everybody had said, Oh, like, Oh, self published. Like, Oh no, that's so tricky. And you need like a publishing team. And it's sort of funny because it's like, Oh, Islamic books. I don't know about, um, you know, in the different places you guys have lived or live, but at least like in California, which is where I'm from, is like the, if you go to like the Barnes and Nobles or uh, bookstore, it's like the Islamic section is like two books, maybe three. Yeah. <laughs> you know? mm. And it's usually like a Quran and like a Rumi book and then like an anti-Islamic book, you know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh, oh yeah, man. no like publishers are gonna care, you know, whatever. And I was like, okay, cool, I don't care. Like I'm gonna do it anyways, which is cool because now it's funny because it's like the penguin house or the random house. They're like, hey, what's up? You know, like, cool, like, can we do something together? And it's like really funny because it's like the definition of, um, I think just, yeah, I have nothing against like capitalist culture, but I think it's the definition of that. And I think I'm just grateful because I, I never did this for, for that. And I, and I still don't, I don't like, I never set out to do that. And I don't consider myself like a, you know, this, great scholar or I always say like I, I this is definitely the best description like I'm just a flower picker like I think that's the best explanation is like mm. I go through the gardens of other people's like incredible works and I'm able to like pick and say I think this is really beautiful and I kind of put it together in a bouquet and then go to like a bunch of teachers and professor and be like does this sound okay is this like halal to you and then they sort of check it off and then it's like offering it to a bigger community of people. And I think the reason it's weird because I, like before that, there's so many <clears throat> theological differences in the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. You have so many different angles and quote unquote denominations, like looking at things and it's so like taboo to like jump in this book. And then that book's like, Oh, don't read that off or don't listen to this perspective. It's so like fractured. Like we could have huge interfaith things with like a rabbi and um like a a Buddhist monk and a Christian pastor, but then it's like as Muslims it's so like shattered inside that it's like if someone says a little bit too much about the family of the prophet, it's like huh. if someone says a little bit too much about a companion, huh? And it's like constantly so focused, like a hyper focus on separation, which I think it like in a scholarly conversation, like I think it has its place to like talk about, but I think for the m average Muslim, they just want to know how to be a better person. Like I almost, I never get questions ever about political anything. I'd say I've probably have gotten over 10,000 <clears throat> questions in my life <clears throat> online and 99.999% of them is about attachment, grief, sadness, heartbreak, uh, trying to find connection to God, being worthy enough to have a relationship with God. And none of those is about um, like these really intricate subjects that most books are talking about, which is like political. Not that political and historical things are not important because I do think history is important in terms of context. And like, I think it's important to point out like if another, like if, I have some Islamic professors and stuff like, hey, like, can you advise us on a book to write? I'm like, yes. Think in terms of people are suffering. What can you offer them from the tradition? That's like, that's a secret. If you wanted to know that, that'd be my secret. Hmm. 
That's yeah. beautiful. I'm gonna go out on a limb, and I'm so glad you mentioned all that because uh, I feel like, and maybe I'm completely wrong with this, and obviously you've re- interacted with your readers more than any of us have, but I feel like this is a book for, uh, dare I use the word, the disenfranchised, um, particularly in America, Muslim youth who feel like they they're no longer getting um, religion, uh, you know, in a way that kind of helps them. Uh, and again, this is a very sweeping statement at the mosque or, or from the speakers or, you know, as you said, there's so many sectarian, you know, uh, fights these days. Um, and, and, and people, I feel I like just want to connect to God. That's it. They just want to hey, teach me how to, to love God. Teach me how God loves me again. Um, would, do you think that's a, a, um, a commonality in, in, in your readers based on you know, like your interactions with them online? Uh, and, and why do you think this book uh, has spoken to so many American youth specifically? Uh, being a Muslim who lives in America and understands, I guess, the community in America. Yeah, I think you're spot on. I think that um, there's an issue of not being seen with the American experience, which is usually like having two feet in different cultures. And um, I feel like most of the readers of the book are looking for redemption. They're looking for the opportunity to be able to step back into a relationship with God, um, most of which are have experienced moments with God, um, whether they were born Muslim or, or not. But somewhere along the line, they felt like they did something or experienced something that made them now unworthy of having that relationship. And I think we don't talk in terms of that too often. Like That hopelessness is usually just branded as not having enough faith and not praying enough instead of just that's just the voice of the the -hmm. devil that approaches every single person like that's not you see that with prophet job like you see that i mean you see that with adam in the beginning of it all and who fell further in terms of distance quite metaphorically than than adam did and yet god's turning to him with with words of guidance and in his repentance so I think we just, I know that my te- the reason I found, you know, my teacher, he, he the, the really brought me into the heart of Islam. He, he was a imam at the Masjid al-Aqsa and he, for, for like 40 years, and he, st- like he stood for unity. And I think there was a, a particular day where they wanted him to say something that was political. Um, in terms of that, that wasn't right, that was unjust, and he just after forty years stepped down. And was like, wow. oh, okay, I guess I'm done now, you know. And there's this approach that it's like he's coming from a place of love, like a, he stands for love, and he's so it was used so religious in terms of religion and had you know the religious courts and stuff like that it was a general. But then when it comes to redemption, it's like doors are open, no matter who you are, and I think for me it allowed like it was such a gift because it allows me to be present and he's like be able to be in palestine and be in saudi arabia and like learn deeply but then also go to um iran and go to karba and like learn different traditions and like the beauty of the different perspectives without having this like separate because i see i'm like i know that every viewpoint has something to offer people who are suffering if you could put aside like the great grand differences, although I think, again, I think that there's a place for that in conversations. I just feel like I've been guided to like, just offer people actual like modes of like dealing with, like there's a huge wave of, like you said, disenfranch- disenfranchisement, but also just like this huge wave of um, um, oh, like a weight of shame but if, if you look online, like how many speeches talked on shame? How many speeches talk on the weight of of sin and like how that deters people? How many how many speeches talk in terms of that? It's often not that. It's often stories, which is super important. Again, like I love stories. But if unless we can find a way to tie that together, I think you do that, Marie, with like you use story and your poetry. Um, and I think I think that's why it's so powerful. But it's also like you're incorporating principles in the deep teachings of the stories of the prophet's family, for example. So I think I don't know. It's a combination, and I'm I'm hoping. Uh, one of the things I'm really interested in 
is like, it sounds so funny and silly because I feel like a little tiny little hill compared to the mountain of knowledge amongst teachers and professors in Islamic studies. But I'm hoping to like stand on Secrets of Divine Love briefly enough to be like, could you write about these topics? Because I know you have way more information Mm. and knowledge than I do. And it would take me like 10 years what would take you like eight months, you know? Um, so I'm really hoping, inshallah, if God uses me that way. Inshallah. H- how can we, I feel like you, know, you, you mentioned something very important there, which is obviously the, the, the as we're talking about disenfranchised youth growing up, I feel like one thing I've noticed growing up, and I, I've definitely fallen into this trap. Um, growing up as a youth, you know, especially, um, I guess, in our, in our communities of what, or what you've seen there's this constant need to belong there's this need to be vocal about you, your, yourself and and who you are right and i feel like youth who become religious at a young ages in their teens as a result either they fall fall into quote unquote just because it's a popular term extremism or for example they fall into uh sectarian debates you know online it, it, it's just full of it you know it, it's not it's not like a it doesn't it's it's obvious it doesn't come from a place of love it's just a very you know it, it's almost like a battleground without fists i mentioned in the last episode um so just mm. generally you know how can we teach youth essentially to, to 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 practice from a place of love as as opposed to from a place of you know what i feel like is them covering up their own insecurities with religion as opposed to actually practicing true religion which is love and the only reason i i, I feel like i can say that is because i've i've fallen into that trap myself uh, growing up um so i mean how can we bring youth out of that out of that vacuum that they're in now into this place of love uh, and gratitude and uh, you know um, manifesting uh, God's blessings? That's a wonderful question. Um, I think you would. Uh, the, so actually, it's funny because I used and I still do it, but uh, I used to do this more. Which every few months I would make one post on my social media, and I would call it the spring cleaning post. And um, it was a bit counterculture in terms of usually how social media is used to like grow a following. The point of this post was like spring cleaning. So I literally, all I would say would be, I would say Muslim equals Sunni (laughs) equals Shia. That's it. And I would lose heaps of followers. (laughs) And and then the, (laughs) the comments would explode into battleground without fists or battle without fists, like you mentioned. And it would just go on, like just like violent, like rude, mean. Every principle of Islam would be shattered in standing up for Islam. And then I'd get heaps of DMs, like just from every side, like, oh my God, are you, ah, oh my God, you're, oh my God, like just freaking out. And then I, the following post would just be like, cool, cool, like remember how you stand up for your faith. And like the, the ways in which you stand up for it don't go against its very principles. Because when you called someone a, um, it's like a weird one. I remember someone calling someone like a coconut. And I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> no, like when you called someone a, a coconut or whatever version, and some of, I had to like block certain words because it got pretty bad. I was like, when you use an offensive nickname, remember in the Quran that it talks about using offensive nicknames. So in standing up for your perspective, you went against God's word. And Mm. how right could you be? How right could you be in doing that? And remember that if you had no mercy in the way that you interacted to stand up for the prophet, peace be upon him, his family or his companions, how right could you be? Even if your technical facts in the sight of God or how the angels have written was correct. Like how right could you be if your heart was filled with separation? Like, And so it was a confrontation on the people who stayed and didn't unfollow. Um, But I always thought it was interesting because it was like this moment of reminder that you could be saying all these things around mercy and love, but it's the confrontation and the friction that unveils the fire inside. I always think in terms of um, I think I said this in the book, but one of my teachers said this to me. He said, you know, until Adam showed up, the devil's arrogance was hidden. Mm. You know? Kind of like he was the phosphorus tip of a match. He had all that fire <laughs> in him, but 
it was cold. Like there was no manifestation. And then the friction came and it lit and he's like blamed, you know, the, the friction, friction to surface for its fire. But the fire was always in him, you know? And so it's like you, you could blame an idea for how you feel, but your feelings, the idea can only point to what's already in you or that conversation can only point to what's already in you. And so I remember one of my teachers in response to your question, so there's a long no, turnaround please. to it, is he said, actually she said, um, she said that, um, I was like, you know, what, what, what happens if someone hurts you? How do you, how do you stand up for that? Like your, your feelings are hurt. You know, someone says something that's very hurtful. Maybe it's your belief system, maybe to your ideas of reality. How do you, when do you say like, hey, that hurt? And I remember she's like, when you're no longer angry about it. I'm like, when I'm no longer angry, she's like, yeah, because when you speak from your anger alone, most people hear your anger alone. So what they hear is your emotional state and not what you're bringing. And so when you can turn to someone, because people love to say, Oh, enjoying what is good, forbid what is wrong. I'm always like, enjoying what is good. Did you skip that part? You went straight to forbidding everything that was wrong. But do you realize that until you could celebrate people and have a relationship with them, you can't go to them and advise them. Did they ask you what was the context? The prophet, peace be upon I don't know many, narr- I don't know any narrations of him walking around being like, your pants are too long, too short. Your job's too back. Your hair is out. Like he never walked around town like pointing. But when people came to him, he would say like, he would, he would listen and advise. Or even like there's, and I think there's a story of, um, and I'm not sure about like, cause some of the stories, like, I don't know. I don't know if there's like a, uh, the source on this one, but we, um, Imam Hussein, Imam Hassan, and they're like, some old man is like doing his wudu or whatever, and he's like doing it wrong. And they're like sitting there, like thinking, how do we tell him how to do it right without hurting his heart? Who does that? Mm. Like two boys thinking, okay, and they're like, all right, and they come up with a scheme, you know, like where they do the wudu and go and ask the man, like, do you think that we're doing this right? And they both do it the same. And the man's like, oh, I just realized that I was doing it wrong. Like, imagine the gentleness in that approach. But we have like girls at the mosque doing, you know, wudus. I have a friend and somebody like takes water out of the sink and like throws it on her face. And she's like, you're not doing it right. (laughs) There's not a lot of mercy. And so what I would say is the confrontation for myself is where is my heart when I'm giving this advice or writing this comment? Because God will ask me about me, not them. Mm. God will ask me where I came from, not where they came from. When someone comes with hatred and I meet it with hatred, God will not ask me about them. He will ask them about them. So I'm not worried about what other people are doing because I won't need to stand up for them and they won't stand up for me. So when someone says something, and if you hurt a heart, like that is a heavy burden. I think we don't understand that sometimes. We forget like it's a heavy burden. God doesn't need you to stand up for your religion or your ideas of faith hurting other people. He doesn't need you. It's like he told the prophet, peace be upon him, you just share the message. What happens after, it's not up to you. And that's the prophet of God. Like, Peace be upon him. He's like the greatest man ever in all of history. So I, like little Helwa, like I don't, I don't believe I can change anybody's heart. I just know that if I can be kind and through God's grace, God can do whatever He wills. Profound. It's profound. Thank you. Almost on the verge of tears. I uh, was trying to hide it away from the camera. Um, <laughs> beautiful. Um, hmm. One thing I wanted to ask you was that you know. I feel like it's one thing to understand, dare I call it, the theory of faith. So let's say, for example, uh, you go through something hard in life, a car crash or, I don't know, lose your money or your job or whatever. It's one thing to say, uh, you know, you understand the logic of this. Okay, God's doing this for me. Um, You know, uh, 
I understand that I need to faith. I, I understand that I have to have faith. Be patient. How do you go from the theory of that to actually practicing that faith? Because again, it, it, it's a very. I, th- I feel like faith is. You know, I, don't, I feel like we don't talk about this enough. Faith is a very hard thing. It's very easy to say. You know, if if something bad happens to you, hey, just make sure you, uh, you know, have faith and you know you'll be okay. But <clears throat> even though that person might understand the theory of it, going from that theory to actually practicing that, living and breathing that, um, is a, is a, is a huge challenge. One of the hardest things that any of us will, will, will do in our life. Um, how can we go from the theory of faith to the practicality of it, in your opinion? That's a really good question. Um, the first word that comes to mind is very messy. It's a messy process. Um, and it's one that you have to just step into. And I think for me, one of the great blessings that I received from my teachers was, yeah, I remember we were, we were doing, we were, we were learning about dhikr and our teachers like guided us and like they gave us some, you know, dhikrs to practice and go do and um, work with, I guess. And one of my teachers, like I, you know, I did my prescription, I guess, and came back and she, she said, how are you? And I was like, yeah, I'm good. And she said, no, how are you? And the emphasis was not, I think often when we ask, how are you? It's more about, give me good and fine. And I'll say, I'm good too. And you keep moving forward. Let's, let's move on. <laughs> yeah, right. It's, but she made this emphasis on you. Like, how are you? And I remember my response was just to break down and cry because I noticed that no one had ever asked me that question mm. sincerely, wanting an answer. And so for me, that was that was the beginning of what you're saying in terms of like, well, what does faith look like in practice? Because the Quran, remember, is sent as a mercy and a healing. Healing. But what they don't tell you about healing, to heal, <laughs> you first identify where you're sick. And so healing begins in sickness, in a sense. And so ex- I think putting faith in practice begins with feeling the places inside of you that hurts. I think a lot of times we have spiritual bypass, which is like, how are you? Alhamdulillah. Not to say that Alhamdulillah is not a good response, but I remember, I'll never forget, I asked a friend of mine, I was like, how are you doing? It was like a text and she said, Alhamdulillah, period. But I welcome death. I'm like, whoa, like, you know, like, <laughs> Damn. it was just like, almost, it was like poetic, you know? Wow. And I, but I remember when she said that, I was like, you know, what does Alhamdulillah mean? Like, in what are we, are we is, is it spiritual bypass? Is that what we're, obviously we're not called to do that. So I think for me, it became Alhamdulillah means Alhamdulillah that I have God in this moment that's really difficult. It doesn't mean that everything was great. It means I'm grateful for having a God even when things aren't great. I'm grateful for having a God that is, that is known and unchanging, even when my future is unknown and constantly changing. You know, I'm grateful for having a stable presence in my life. It's kind of like, you know, if you anchor a boat to another boat, do you don't know when you, where you'll end up in, the middle, in eight hours, you know? You anchor your boat to something stable. And so, I think looking at faith and practice, it actually begins in being like, here are the places where I've anchored myself into thing, other boats. And being honest with yourself. Being like, hey, I can be honest. I have an attachment to this person. And how it plays out in my life is this way. And then faith is like, literally teaches you how to detach yourself and reattach yourself to Allah. It's like, here's the rope of God, hold on to it. To hold on to the rope of God, you have to let go of other, other ropes. So it begins with a letting go. And I think that's like the power of la ilaha. It's like, there is no God. You let go, let go, let go, let go of everything that you could have placed. So then, illallah, you grab the one rope. And so I think stepping into faith and practice, it actually looks a lot like letting go. It looks a lot like facing pain. It looks a lot like admitting illness. And that's how you receive God's mercy and healing and 
like I always say, like I think it was like this moment of great excitement for me when I realized that my weakness allowed me to have access to God's greatness. Mm. And my brokenness allowed me to experience God's wholeness. Like until that moment, I couldn't taste that. And I realized that the mercy of what happened with Adam in the garden was, it was in his turning away or forgetfulness that he was able to remember and to realign and like the sweetness of that return that was like the gift of repentance was given to us through him um i don't know if that answered your question but you just took me on a journey left and right i I know i just i just wanted to listen the whole time i (laughs) I don't want to disturb this but um i do have a few questions um more related to the art of 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 creating your book so i'm going to take a step back um, I know you were men- you mentioned, and I even read it. I think it was like earlier in the book where you you like kind of made it clear, like you like you're not this side or that side. Like you're you don't <laughs> select the specific group or sector. You just are what what you are. Um, so basically, something that, that that came to mind is you know throughout the book, you know you read Rumi quotes and you read quotes from other saints, and you, and, and they're all beautiful. So. You know, when you when you vet this information and like you mentioned earlier, like, you know, sometimes you'll come across a, a scholar or somebody who they don't take from this book or don't take from that book. Um, and, 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 you know, having the plethora of knowledge, how do you vet um, what is true or what should go into in the book from from your side? Like, do you have do you get all this information, go to your scholar and be like, hey, like, how do I filter through what's what I want or what I don't want? Uh, that's kind of my question. That's a great question. Um, yeah, so I think it's also a preference. Um, my, actually <clears throat> my favorite form of writing is poetry. So I'm inclined towards like a more poetic articulation. And so a lot of the quotes like I picked leaned in that direction instead of leaning towards like a heavy theological, more dry academic approach. Which is like, I kind of think of, um, you know, Rumi is like, you know, you're pulling rubies out of granite. It's kind of, for me, reading is like that. I'm reading dry academic books. Um, and I'm like looking for the rubies to pull. Because I think that people actually, I think poetry or metaphor and symbolism allows people to step away and have their own experience. Um, instead of always just saying it like word for word explanation of something that can be really drawn out. I think that's the power of um, the Quran. Well, one of the powers of it is that it is steeped in symbolism. And so, you know, you could approach it in different ways. You know, a poet may approach the Quran differently because of their emphasis on symbols. And, you know, a scientist approaches it differently. And then the average person approaches it differently. And so, the quotes I picked, I wanted them to have a, a like level of depth and depending on where you were, like sometimes you go deeper into it, but also it's just preference. But then like thirdly, yeah, I, I did have um, a few different imams um, look at the book and give me their opinions on, I was more concerned with theological ideas than the quotes because, you know, with Rumi, for example, a lot of the things he said, especially English translation, some of them are a different poet, like Shabastari or right, right. Rizakshadi or whatever. And there's like a different steeped idea. And the poet translated it slightly this way versus, I mean, the translated book. But when it, my concern was not so much in that as much as the idea of what was articulated. Is it accurate? Is it in alignment with Islamic ideas? And I think it was Imam Ali who said, like, think, look more in terms of what is said than who is saying it, because sometimes there's like profound knowledge. Um, and you would be discriminating um, before you even had access to hear what was right. said. And so, and I, I mean, one of the, he is, you, Ali ibn Talib, Imam Ali, but however you want to refer to him, is like referred so often in the text, which made a lot of people very uncomfortable. They're like, why is he quoted so much? And I also thought that was like another very interesting point, you know, again, like teacher, he um, was a Sunni scholar, he like wrote a whole book on Ahlul Bayt and he talked about the story of Ashura and like all this stuff like he was like really yeah so I don't know for me it was always so weird that that was like a big point of discomfort 
And I think, um, but it was also kind of exciting because I was like, oh, I see that this is a nerve people have, which is weird considering however you may look at this figure in history, he's either the fourth, um, you know, successor of the prophet or he's the first. Or if you're in the mystical traditions, he's the spiritual successor um, of 39 out of 40 orders in, in the Sufi tradition. So it's like, however you look at this, it's a very important person. Why are you so upset? So I didn't understand that, you know? So I knew that that was a political nerve, like it hit people. In like a, And yet this person's too profound to leave them out. So if it comes up for you, that gives you an opportunity to deal with it, I mean, my, in my opinion. So... Um, yeah, so some of the choices that people didn't really like. Like, oh, why did you do too many quotes from Rumi, you know? And so there were right. always, there's going to be somebody, always, there's going to always say, like, my friend, actually, my friend says, she's like, you're not ice cream. Everyone's not going to like you. You know, you just got to. That's true. Okay. Apart from Hasnain, um, everyone loves Hasnain. He's the only guy that everyone loves. Right, Hasnain? Nah, everybody hates me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do have uh, one, other, one other question before Nui takes over, uh, more revolving the, the book. Um, you said yourself published, um, and the book is amazing. Like even um, the like the cover page, like the cover art is just is just the way it's it's fully put together. I absolutely love it. And, and you've also you know, got these little designs in between, right? On like uh, the I, I love and them. Too, yeah. Yeah. So like the the most craziest thing for me was this book was referred to me at a time in my life where I wasn't doing well, right? Um, because I, I read The Alchemist, right? Like, everybody's like, Oh, you have to read The Alchemist. The Alchemist is an amazing book. Like, if you're going through a bad time, just read The Alchemist. All right, great. Um, and like, my favorite chapter in the book is, is chapter three, is like the mysteries of the Quran, right? Because at that same time, I kind of reconnected with the Quran myself. Um, aside all these, all these like stories and stuff like that, um, through the process of creating this book, what, what would you say? You know, if, if I was somebody who was going through the process of creating a book, what, what would be one advice you would give me and what would be like the hardest thing you went through when creating this book? Great question. Um, I love that. Most because I hope a lot of people, I hope people can feel motivated to like listen. If, I ever, if ever I share anything, it's that I'm not qualified to write a book like this. And I think that's one of the, for anybody out there that's thinking about writing a book, I'm not qualified to write a book like this. And I believe that if God calls you to do something, he qualifies you. He brings people into your life that help you make it a possibility. As long as you just realign to your intention and you continuously realign to your intention, God will bring, this is my experience, God will bring people into your life. I, I literally, in my book, one of the, the first advice I would give is wherever you're stuck, make a prayer. Like if you're like, oh man, like I remember, I was searching so hard for the spiritual symbolism in the Salat. I'm like, oh, I can't find it anywhere, like online, in books. I just like could not find it. And then a professor out in, um, I think it was, yeah, Michigan State University that I connected with, he, I sent him a few chapters. I was like, hey, can you give me some theological corrections? And he hit me back literally with one title. And he said, hey, check out this book. I think there's something in it for you. I didn't think anything. I just bought it. It arrived flipping through it, boom, spiritual symbols of prayer. Mm. Like I've been searching for this for years. I couldn't find it. And it's like the moment the prayer is cast about, it's like, it's almost feels like this is like, this may sound weird, but it almost feels like God has always, God has already answered every prayer we'll ever make. Cause he's not stuck in time. The moment we make a prayer, it's like we can reach out into that answered prayer cloud and like receive that already answered prayer and i think like the power of making having a, a dua or like a prayer is that you 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 tune yourself to receiving that thing that's already out there for you and so that's the first thing i'd say if you're writing a book and you're stuck make a prayer ask god for help like oh i need an editor like i need someone who make corrections i need a typesetter which is like the interior design of the book i need a cover designer i need somebody who does illustration like i don't know who to pick i don't know anybody and suddenly it's like it becomes apparent to you who to turn to. And so that's one, make a prayer where you're stuck. And then the other one, in terms of making a book like very um, logistically, I actually think the most important step you'll take is the interior design of the book. It's like the least, it's the uh, most overlooked. 
in terms of self-published and actually most Islamically published like publishers, Islamic publishers, they don't, I don't think do a industry standard job of the typesetting inside the interior. So that took me a very long time. It may just sound simple because it's like, okay, cool. And one of the things I really learned about typesetting is it's good typesetting if it doesn't disturb you. Like if as a reader, you're not like, oh, this kind of annoys me, this margin annoys me. Or like, why are the words all the way to the end of the page? I have nowhere to write notes. So typesetting very logistically would be like the logistic advice I'd give. Like find a good typesetter and make sure that you don't like skim on that because your book will look public, like a published book. Um, if you have that typesetting, which helped me out because actually my book is technically published through different countries, through different publishers now, um, and they didn't have to do anything to it. They just took it as is because the typesetting is, which makes it a uniform print across different countries, which is what I wanted. But that would be um, my like advice. Nuri made a, made a promise for a great co-host, but he unfortunately ended up with me. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm you got, sorry about that, man. You know, this, this is where faith comes in. Have faith that Allah forgive you for, for a reason. <laughs> um, I want to wind down. I want to wind down, uh, inshallah, with uh, um, a question about, uh, you know, you talk, I mean, love is the very first word in the book, if I'm not mistaken. And you talk a lot about, you know, practicing from a place of love. Um, and I feel like it has been a very, dare I say this, a very trendy thing uh, to talk about these mm -hmm. days, to what, you know, practicing from a, from a place of love. Um, so I guess. I'll ask you two questions. Um, the first one is, why is it so important to practice from a faith of love? But also, off, off the back of that, how do, we, how do we ensure that we don't fall into this trap of, um, you know, uh, I guess, misunderstanding love and, and using that as an excuse uh, to do sin? Or, for example, uh, you know, how do we hate from a place of love? Because, you know, you still have to, I guess, in, in many ways, I don't know if you yeah. want to use the word, hey, you've got to forbid the evil, right? You've got to dislike the fact that for example you're not praying on time you gotta dislike your sins you gotta dislike your i guess your lusts um so, so how do you hate from a place of love and then second question why is it so important to practice from a place of love great question um so i would say love love is an interesting thing because i think a lot of times when people hear it an eruption of images come comes up for them for me, in the terms of <laughs> in terms of religion, it, the image that comes up is death. Mm. Uh, sl sounds slightly morbid, but it's not to me. I think that that love is a shattering of the ego. I think that in love, you can't come as a separate self. That there's a u unifying element. That there's unity. There's oneness, and there's no space for the ego. In terms of divine love, so the secret of that divine people is like, what's the secret of divine love? And I'm like. I think to me the secret is you die to yourself to welcome all that God wants to give to you. Right? And, and part of that is how to practice from love is that you show up ready to let go of identity. Hmm. Let go of the things that you define yourself to be. That your personality, your traits are really a bundle of reactions to life's experiences perpetuated through wounds that maybe you experienced as a child. And so everything is to what, who you think who you think you are most likely is an illusion. And for me, what love does, love says, give me that illusion and I'll give you reality. So practicing from a place of love means showing up ready to give up these things that you attach your worth to. And so in terms of what does that look like, um, in, in prayer for me is, is it reminds me of, um, I remember one, I guess like a pastor. Uh, he said that, you know, you know, there's this famous book, I think it's Gary Chapman, the five love language, languages. And he's like, God's love language is obedience. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's this, that there is a love language with God and it's alignment. I would say we, we have some negative connotations of obedience, but, I would say it's alignment. I do think it's obedience. Like, we're really good about saying, God, you are my Lord. We're really bad about saying, I am your servant. Like, that's the part we struggle. We don't have, most people don't, most Muslims are like, yeah, yeah, God's the Lord. Like, I'm like, and you're his servant. And they're like, yeah, but what does that mean? <laughs> I'm like, it means that 
you don't move in life based on your preferences, but based on God's guidance. And they're like, whoa, 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 that doesn't resonate to me. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm in California, so we have a lot of, that doesn't resonate with me, how long? <laughs> and I'm like, that's true. That's true, it doesn't resonate. But you know what resonate means? It means that it doesn't align with my already um, accepted beliefs. So you're not learning anything new. Like when someone says, duh, 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 that doesn't resonate. It may not resonate, but just because it doesn't resonate, it doesn't mean it's, it's, it's wrong. Because hmm. sometimes the ego doesn't like that. The ego's like, what? Wake up at three to pray before prayer? But that doesn't really resonate. I don't really feel like I'm present. You know, like in prayer. And so we, then if we judge, it, it's a good example is if I go to prayer, I'm praying us. I'm like, okay. Um, I'm like, after the prayer, I'm like, really didn't feel like I, that I was really present in that prayer. So I should just stop praying, which means I dictate my relationship with God based on a fleeting feeling. And it, we're like, most people are like, that makes sense. Do you like be happy, like do what makes you happy. But you would never give that advice to someone who's married. Hmm. You would never say, huh, you're on a trip. You don't feel like being uh, faithful, <laughs> so you should just do whatever you want. You know, so there's this, we would never give that advice to people, but in relationship with God, we often have like a lax boundary because we're like, well, God loves us. His love is unconditional. Very true. But the question is, how much of that love are you receiving if your hands are closed and the caps, the lids are on? Because I could put an empty bucket outside in a rainstorm and it, it, it comes back with nothing. And that's the same, I think, in our relationship with God. It's like, and, and the way I describe it is like the sun is always out. But when the earth turns away, it's darkness. <clears throat> and so by our eyes, it's as if the sun turned off, but the sun never stopped shining. And so the question is, how you want to, do you want to be in the daylight or not? And, that, and if you experience a flickering in the light, it has to do with your turning, not God's um, light turning off, you know? And so for me, in terms of, of love, that's what it looked like. It's practicing from love is showing up and saying, I am here, I'm committed. And in the ups and downs when things don't make sense, like if you're in a relationship with your wife or in a relationship with the husband, and it's like, oh, this is a bad week, it's a hard week. You don't feel the same strong connection. You stay through because, because love, because you made a commitment. And I think it's the same in terms of religious practices. If we approach it in that way, um, yeah. So profound, Halua. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Really appreciate you too, Esme, and your absolute uh, wisdom. Uh, the first guest to bring me to tears. Uh, so well done. Hasnain's heart is very hard, so he didn't ever cry. So no one can ever make him cry. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to get there slowly. <laughs> um, where can people buy your book? Where can people find you on social media? And what can we expect next from you as well? Oh, um, yeah. So uh, the website is um, secretsofdivinelove.com and. You could find the book for different countries. I know maybe some of your listeners are from different areas in the world, and that's like the easiest resource. Uh, it's on Amazon, and it's available in different bookstores, but that's probably the first source. Um, in terms of what's next, um, I'm working on a Ramadan journal. Um, I'm hoping to do a Secrets of Divine Love journal, mostly just because um, me and my friends, you know, when, when we in Ramadan, or even when we did some book clubs on the book, it's like, there's so many cool questions to ask each other and like to investigate deeper in relationship with faith that I thought it'd be cool to offer. And actually the prison work kind of inspired that. So um, yeah, inshallah, I hope that that comes out by this next Ramadan. And um, I'm available on a Helwa. I think that's my Instagram name um, or Quran quotes daily as well. Uh, if you wanted to connect deeper and I'm sending you all of my love. Wonderful. Can't wait to see it. Inshallah. Hello. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank Sound you good. so much. Appreciate it.